Welcome everyone to the 2021 Winter Center Life Series and a special welcome to those of you that are joining us uh, for the first time or rejoining us. I uh, want you to know that all that we're doing is being recorded and will eventually uh, be on our website. I think there's some already up um, and we're working diligently towards getting the rest of uh, the series uh, recordings on the website. My name is Jack Fortin and I'm the curator and host of the Centered Life series. We're really glad that you're in, you uh, have joined us. Our theme is stepping into 2021 with hearts rekindled and hope awakened. It was Henry Allen, Henry Nowen who said, it is in being fully rooted in the heart of God <laughs> that we are creatively connected with our neighbor as well as with our deepest self. In the heart of God, we can see that the other human beings who live on this earth with us are also God's daughters and sons and belong to the same family that we do. And so we claim our own belovedness before God as we celebrate with our neighbors uh, life together. And so. That's why we use this title this year of Hearts Rekindled and Hope, and Hope Awaken. Um, today, um, we are very privileged to have um, Reverend Kelly Chapman with us and to, to lead us today. And I um, wanna say a few things about Kelly. And then uh, uh, we'll ask Kelly to do his presentation. Um, probably many of us know Kelly because he's been the senior pastor at Redeemer Lutheran Church and director for the Redeemer's nonprofit, uh, Redeemer Center for Life, that serves a, and serves as an advisor to the Bishop of Minneapolis Area Synod for the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America. I'll give you a little history of Kelly, in case you don't know. Uh, between 1995 and 2001, Kelly served as the director for youth ministries for the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, and as a teacher and dean of residence at one point at Oregon Episcopal School. Many of you may or may not know that Redeemer is on the north side of Minneapolis, is a very diverse congregation with a 108 year history in the Harrison neighborhood of North Minneapolis. The congregation's nonprofit includes a bike and coffee shop, some youth development, a health commons, uh, and is, is very active in attaining housing and employment programs in the area. Kelly has served on a variety of boards, some of which are youth prize, um, Eon Affordable Housing Development, Gustavus College, the Lutheran Volunteer Corps, Plymouth Christian Youth Center, and of course the Harrison Neighborhood Association in which his church is lodged. Kelly is also the Princeton Theological Benjamin E. Mays Fellow with the Fund for Theological Leadership, which is a reflective group out of Atlanta um, that uh, continues to do research around theological leadership. He was also the 2006 recipient of the Luther Seminary Race, Church, and Change Award. Um, he was also Portland, Oregon, where he did some teaching there. He was Portland Public Schools Volunteer of the Year in 1992. He was the Mayor Citizen of the Year for Portland in 2003, and he's been the recipient of the Tom Hunstad Award for Distinguished Leadership in Youth and Family Ministry. Probably most importantly, Kelly is married to an amazingly gifted woman, Dr. Cheryl Chapman, who is currently the Executive Vice President and Dean at Concord University in St. Paul. Upon his retirement, Kelly um, is now refired into being the current director of the Center for Leadership and Neighborhood Engagement. 
And I thought, Kelly, as a way for people to know a little bit more about you, I know there's you'll be referring this in your presentation, but could you tell us a little bit about um, the purpose and direction of this new center uh, before we begin? Yes, uh, the Center for Leadership and Neighborhood Engagement was birthed uh, through a, a campaign with Lutheran Social Services of Minnesota, uh, the nonprofit Redeemer Center for Life, and the Minneapolis Area Senate, and it's to engage more congregations in their neighborhoods. Uh, there's research that says that congregations that are involved in their neighborhoods show uh, signs of vitality, and so uh, to connect our congregations beyond the walls of our church buildings is uh, a primary mission, and uh, and part of that is also uh, to become more intercultural and in relating to the people uh, and the diversity that surrounds many of our congregations, and that reflects the people that we work with, that we study with, and we play with as a more diverse population than we typically find in many of our congregations. Well, thanks, thanks, Kelly. Um, I guess we want people to know, Kelly, as you speak, if anyone has questions, they can go to the chat at the bottom of your screen and li leave your question. You can see uh, the, the little diagram currently, how, this, how you do that, that red arrow, the, I don't know what it is, magenta colored arrows pointing to the chat room. And um, also we do have some closed captioning for those who might be hard of hearing. Um, just so you know that Heather Riddle um, will be the one who's gathering those questions and at our Q and A time at the end, um, she'll be the ones that will bring to light the questions that you all might have to Kelly. Kelly, I think at the time that we planned for you making this presentation, I think neither of us were aware that the trials surrounding the death of George Floyd would be uh, at this very time. And so I think in some ways your presentation is taking on special significance. So again, I thank you for being with us today, uh, particularly at this critical juncture, both in our state and the impact that this trial and some other trials will have on the nation. So with eager anticipation, Kelly, uh, I invite you to your presentation. Thank you, Jack. And uh, just a word of uh, thank you particularly for mentioning the, the uh, Chauvin trial uh, for the death of George Floyd. And uh, uh, our organization, the Center for Leadership and Neighborhood Engagement, we are pleased to be convening a, a prayer time that each day throughout the trial, uh, we're working with local leaders in, in Minneapolis to convene a time of prayer, uh, 20 minutes each morning uh, as we pray for the George Floyd trial and recognizing that while the, the murder of George Floyd was a local incident, um, it has drawn the attention uh, not only locally, but nationally and globally. And so that attention here in Minneapolis and in the heart of our concerns of our entire nation and our world, um, about justice and uh, addressing uh, many of the inequities that continue to exist in our in our world. So I thank you for that, mentioning that and encourage and invite others to remember Minneapolis in your prayers as we, uh, as we experience uh, and walk through this time of, of trial and deliberation. So thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so um, our conversation today is about um, a culture of segregation and that movement toward a culture of belonging and inviting a conversation and reflection time uh, in this journey of how is it that we have gotten to where we are in a 400 year history from slavery to segregation and a growing awareness of the inequities in our, in our world and in our systems. And it's, uh, and we, so much of our focus is on policing, but those inequities are, uh, impacting our uh, healthcare system, uh, policing, education, uh, in so many ways. So to be able to look at that uh, prayerfully and um, what is the role of a faith community? Uh, our churches 
uh, for each of us. Um, and also a, a, a thank you to Augsburg as a educational institution that is equipping a much broader diverse uh, education and pool of leaders that are going out into a world that really looks much more like uh, Augsburg uh, than many of our other institutions in the past. So uh, thank you to Augsburg for the ways that you're uh, equipping our current and future leaders. Uh, and so uh, as Jack mentioned, I'm the former pastor at Redeemer Lutheran Church, a wonderfully diverse congregation and a wonderfully diverse neighborhood of Harrison in North Minneapolis. And uh, well, I, saw, I retired from that ministry uh, just a year ago now, uh, just in time to be embraced by a pandemic. And uh, as we are sharing in that ministry, and uh, I wanna begin with a, a brief video uh, introduction of the ministry that Redeemer Lutheran Church is doing uh, and, and their nonprofit Redeemer Center for Life in the Harrison uh, neighborhood, uh, that that might invite us into our reflection and conversation this morning. So, and thank you to AJ for, um, for navigating the technology for us this morning. So AJ, if you may please uh, share the video. The instruments like guitar, drums, piano. I just love music. Redeemer Lutheran Church has been in the neighborhood for over 100 years. Um, Redeemer Center for Life was started by the church in 1999. I get to serve as pastor of the congregation and director for the nonprofit Redeemer Center for Life that hosts a bike shop and a restaurant. It's been in the neighborhood for 40, more than 40 years. A bread oven, you know, housing. I've never been in a community that has so many things going on. We're all like family here. You know, through the different youth programs, you know, that Redeemer has, you know, that I grew up with, you know, we've been introduced to art, um, performing arts, as a first step to being able to express yourself. Called RAP, which is Redeemer After School Program. Kids come in early, they can help prepare the meal and get in the kitchen and learn cooking skills. Then we eat the meal together, and then we have a time of like play and games. And then we have uh, a teaching piece where we have speakers come in. I, I know that they need that positive role model here um, who, who will uplift them and let them know that there are opportunities and open doors out there for them. They make me happy, like the staff, the kids, everything makes me happy. It's so exciting. The staff members, they call each other family and it's really sweet to be a part of it because people help you with life in general, they actually care. When someone walks into the room, there's an assumption that that person has assets and is an essential member of the community or could become an integral part of the community. Lots of people involved who are not of the Lutheran tradition, who are not of the Lutheran faith, who are not even Christian, who are involved in um, the work that we're doing. What it means to be church is to be a place where everybody is welcome and everybody is safe to belong and so. Know that we're connected um, in the midst of being different. Like these branches are, are wide and these roots are deep. Things could be better here in Minneapolis and I want to be a part of that change and definitely um, starting with the children. You know, the children, the next generation is going to be our future. I hope that Anyone that watches this video is inspired. I am a really lucky kid. Thank you, AJ. So Redeemer, if, uh, if you don't glean anything else from uh, our time together, I want to lift up Redeemer Lutheran Church and Redeemer Center for Life as a wonderful ministry. And uh, if you want to look up Redeemer and uh, provide support or learn more about it, it's a, it's a wonderful congregation that I'm no longer a part of, but I really celebrate 
what God is doing at Redeemer. Uh, the wonderful members, uh, uh, Shelby Andrus is a Augsburg grad and uh, one of the members and Mark Hansen, uh, a Bishop Emeritus and uh, his family. So, uh, so I just wanna begin by celebrating a Redeemer and the opportunity to um, draw a little attention that way. So uh, next slide, please. So my name is Kelly Chapman um, and my parents uh, are part of that great migration that we don't hear enough about of African-Americans who moved from the uh, agricultural segregated South to the industrial North in the early 50s uh, as a part of a, a new beginning. And so that migration is an important part of our American history where uh, families uprooted themselves and moved to cities like Detroit and uh, Chicago and uh, uh, Portland. So throughout our nation, that new beginning for families. And uh, my parents were both from Tennessee, they moved to Detroit. And I grew up in a community where Martin Luther King and John F. Kennedy and, and a picture of the Lord's Supper in most homes, you would be sure to see those front and center in, in the dining room or in the living room a picture of Martin Luther King, John F. Kennedy, the Lord's Supper. And that was like an orientation, an important part of the, the American dream, the, the culture. And, and I remember that um, when I was like five years old and I moved to Detroit in the early 50s with my uh, my parents, and that we would stand up and, uh, and part of our uh, uh, acculturation was uh, as children, we would all stand up and we would recite the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag. And so we were oriented to that hope, that promise of an America, uh, the United States that was for everyone. And, and so that was just kind of a grounding and a hope and a kind of promise that so many of our families were, uh, were uh, invested in. Next slide, please. Uh, and so my story is that um, we grew up in a small uh, a neighborhood in Detroit near a place called Hamtramck. So my neighborhood was largely Polish white and African American and, and we all got along really well. And, um, and then my parents moved, uh, bought their home in a new neighborhood. And I was sitting in, in seventh grade and I was listening to my new classmate, a boy named Willie Woods. And Willie was describing how pretty the girls were in his Sunday school. But my family didn't really have a church home. We went to church on Easter at the closest Baptist church. And uh, so I didn't really have like a, a religious discipline of, of attending a church. And I was sitting in, in seventh grade and I was listening to my new classmate, a boy named Willie Woods. And I was enthralled as Willie was describing how pretty the girls were in his Sunday school. And I wasn't particularly religious, but when I heard how pretty those girls were in his Sunday school, I felt a conversion coming on. So I invited myself to visit Willie's church and I walked about a mile to the church according to Willie's direction. And, and I got to this really nice neighborhood called Indian Village, which was really nice homes. and. Uh, my siblings and I had described the homes in the Indian village as mansions when we were children. And uh, so the church that I saw according to Willie's direction was in this beautiful neighborhood. It was this beautiful church building. And I wasn't confident that that was actually Willie's church, but according to Willie's direction, that was the church. So I got up my courage, I walked up the door, I opened the door and I heard children singing. So I imagine this must be the place. And so I took a deep breath and I just walked down the steps and down the hall. And I just followed the voices of those children singing. And just as I rounded the corner, there stood the entire Sunday school. And the entire Sunday school was white. Now this is like 1963. And I was standing there exposed and I had that tape going, you know, about where you belong and where you don't belong. And as I was standing there, the only thing I could think of was, I'm gonna kill Willie Woods. I thought he'd set me up with this masterful middle school prank. And before I could exit, two Sunday school teachers came over to me 
and they have invited me and escorted me to the entire Sunday school. And I stood there in front of the Sunday school as the entire Sunday school began to sing these words. There's a welcome here. There's a welcome here. There's a Christian welcome here. And it's like the clouds open up and I experienced a reality I never imagined about a welcome and a relationship with a community that was different than what I had seen on television or heard about. And so that was my introduction to the church. And I, I became the first black member of that congregation. And over time, my siblings started going to that church and my neighbors and the year that I graduated from college, my parents joined that church. So my story went on that I attended a Lutheran high school and a Lutheran college and a Lutheran seminary. And that's the beginning of my story in terms of the church. And what I would say is this um, assimilation process of moving into and engaging in uh, predominantly white culture and all of those ways of learning uh, and um, wrestling and struggling with uh, what it means to be a black person in a predominantly white uh, institution and culture. Next slide, please. So this has been my professional journey. Uh, I'm a graduate, uh, I attended Christ Seminary and Seminex. I became the director for uh, community family life in, in Washington, D.C. Uh, so I've had these uh, professional experiences, including in uh, at Oregon Episcopal School, which was a very affluent school, uh, where I've done my former students a wedding at a castle in Germany and um, an island in Hawaii, the, it's the same location where Bill Gates got married. So there have been these experiences uh, that I had. Um, and the point of my conversation and bringing these things up with you today is to invite you into my story and for you to be able to hear the story of a Black professional, a Christian Lutheran, in terms of what is the price that, uh, that a person of, of color pays in order to be have a voice, in order to be seen, in order to navigate our, 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 our culture and our church. Uh, next slide, please. So now as uh, we shared with you already, I retired from Redeemer last year in the midst of a pandemic. And in the midst of that was the, door, the death of George Floyd and how the pandemic uh, has been a health crisis in our nation, in our world. But also the murder of George Floyd has surfaced the reality that we also are navigating uh, racism and white supremacy as another manifestation of a kind of pandemic in our world and how it's impacting people's lives in terms of inequities in education and healthcare and, and uh, law enforcement and so many ways how our world is divided and a growing awareness about that and voice, not only here in Minneapolis and in the United States, but across the globe. And uh, thinking about that too, and the conversation that's now happening uh, with the royal family and, and the thing about um, how the issue of race and the awareness, the growing awareness of how it's impacting and, and continues to divide our, um, our, our common experience and our common uh, awareness. Next slide. So again, a reference point of Redeemer, which is a place of celebration of different people and different cultures coming together, but it doesn't just happen automatically, but there's an intention to that. There's a growing awareness of that. There's a power sharing of that. And that's part of what we're gonna talk about and look at in today's conversation. Next slide. So when I was uh, doing my uh, seminary training, uh, there's something called the Clinical Pastoral Education Program, 
where uh, seminarians are required to do their clinical experience uh, in their uh, seminary training. I did mine in Washington, D.C. at Washington Hospital Center. And we were blessed that one of our seminaries in our training, that uh, uh, we had a gentleman named Dr. Edwin Nichols, who was from the National Institute of Health. And he did a presentation talking about worldviews. And he talked about worldviews and how in the United States, people operate out of three basic worldviews. And he was very clear to say that one worldview is not better than another worldview. But in the United States, we operate out of three basic worldviews. And he said that for um, uh, African American, Native American, Latino people, the operative worldview is relationship. So how African American, Latino, Hispanic people, uh, that relationship is fundamental unto how they feel in relationship with their environment, uh, in relationship with the world, in relationship with the place where they work and the people that they work with. So worldview and relationship is paramount in the African-American, Latino, uh, uh, Native American experience. And again, one worldview is not deemed better than another worldview. Then Dr. Nichols said that for Asian people, uh, people from the Pacific Island, the, the dominant worldview there is speaking with one voice, respect for the elders, uh, following the emperor, uh, conformity. So that, that's fundamental to how Asian and Pacific Islander people feel in terms of their relationship with the elder uh, speaking with one voice and respect and conformity. And again, one worldview is not better than another worldview. But then Dr. Uh, Nichols said that for white people, people of European descent, he said that the dominant worldview is acquisition of object. So that's things like, you know, how much do you know? Uh, how much do you make? And the one that I always think about in relationship to acquisition is uh, time, and time is a commodity. And so an example of time as a deeply held value uh, as uh, I, I, I could be in the midst of, let's say, 100 youth who are um, from the Episcopalian or Lutheran or Presbyterian church, and I can ask those young people, how long is a Lutheran or Presbyterian or Episcopalian worship service, uh, and they will likely say what? They'll likely say one hour. And then I would ask them, well, did you learn that in confirmation? So where, where did that sense and that value come from? Similarly, I could ask um, a group of African-American, Latino, uh, uh, Hispanic, uh, Native American youth, how long is a worship service in their tradition? And likely they will say something like all day, or it takes as long as it takes. So those are examples of worldviews and how they are reflected. And Martin Luther King said that Sunday morning is the most segregated hour of the week. And that continues to be a reality today. And thinking about how Sunday morning and how we gather is also a reflection of worldview. So it's not just theology, uh, it, it's, it's how worldview is also reflected in the ways that we gather. Uh, another example of worldview I'd be uh, looking at in the tradition of, let's say, Lutheran uh, Episcopalian Church and how the elements of worship are, are come together. An example of then of uh, acquisition of object or commodity would be um, uh, music as an acquired ability in the Episcopal Lutheran experience. So in the Lutheran church, we often use a hymnal. And in order to facilitate the use of the hymnal, one needs to acquire the ability to read music. And 
here in Minnesota, we have these amazing choirs at like St. Olaf and Augsburg and um, uh, Gustavus and Luther and Concordia and, and Concordia University in St. Paul and, uh, in the Missouri Senate. But, and those choirs, are, they're amazing choirs, but the complexity of that music is an acquired ability. And the more complicated that music, the more the proficiency of doing that music is the high, more highly valued of those choirs. So we're, re, we're deeply rooted in that, in our hymnody, in our, uh, and how that hymnals facilitate that ability. And you contrast that with African American Latino traditions, or Baptists or Pentecostal, and and the ability to read music is often not uh, a, a facility there. And so the music is often repetitious and and um, and not necessarily uh, read. And and the repetition of that music uh, is kind of a, a way of gathering. So look at those contrasts. Yeah. I was once in a, at a social gathering and uh, a seminary professor uh, was in a conversation and I overheard him say that hymnals are forms of ancestry worship. And again, how that is reflected that the hymns that we sing, no matter what the worldview or the tradition, it's a way of remembering those who handed down the faith to us. And so, as we have this endearment uh, that's wrapped in our worldviews, and we say that we want to be together and we want to be more diverse, and yet we're deeply attached to our worldviews. And thinking about that, and thinking about that in the elements of of a of a congregational worship and in our hymnody, uh, and in seminary in our Lutheran tradition, I was taught that a really good sermon will have three points to it. And so our, our members are trained that if they go home and they didn't get those points of a sermon, then maybe they didn't get a good sermon. And we even train our children to listen with their, their little notepads to what are the points of, of the sermon. And that's an acquired ability to, to listen and, and to listen for what are those salient points of a sermon. And, and we're taught as preachers that there should be three of them. Well, you contrast that with the Latino, Hispanic, African-American tradition and the, the, uh, the music or the, or the sermon doesn't necessarily have a point. Amen? 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 It calls into that relationship and the response of relationship. And again, it's not about right or wrong, but recognizing that as we gather, so often we're really rooted in these worldviews that that um, that affirm our ethnic identity, uh, identities that reinforce the traditions and the, uh, the ethnic foundations that we come from. And so I just invite us to think about that when we think about Sunday morning as the most segregated hour of the week. And if we say that we really want to be in relationship, and, and how we worship, and as a community, then, then we, we um, I invite us to, to have dialogue about that and think about that and, and the challenge of, if we want to share the reality of God, we're also challenged to share our worldview. Next slide, please. Uh, now this is uh, something that I learned many years ago from an organization called the Oakland Men's Project and a gentleman uh, named Harrison Sims, uh, who's passed away some time ago. But he talks about um, this actually was called the cycle of oppression. Uh, and I, I, I called it the cycle of exclusion. And I invite us to think about this cycle um, as a reality in our world as well. So the, the cycle begins with targeting or say stereotyping, um, and, and labeling so a person or a group. And then what happens is once we target or we stereotype a person or a group, then we attach misinformation to that person or a group. And then based on the misinformation, that becomes our justification 
or mistreating a person or a group. And then the cycle gets uh, kind of fulfilled in this thing called internalized oppression or internalized behavior. And so the example that I give when I talk about internalized behaviors, so I talk about um, like if I have a dog and every time my dog does something wrong, I kick my dog. Uh, sooner or later, I'll approach my dog and even though it didn't do anything wrong, it will act like it did something wrong. That's an example of internalized behavior. So I'm gonna walk through this with you a few times and, 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 and you can put something in the chat and we can talk about this uh, as we go along as well. So a targeted group, um, let's begin with talking about uh, females, women. And a misinformation about uh, women uh, might be, and again, we're doing this um, a beginning year for its simplicity. Um, and there's no right or wrong about this, but I also want to remind you that as we go through this cycle, none of you read a book. There isn't anything about uh, gathering new external knowledge. This is based on knowledge that we already have within us, right? So women, the misinformation is about uh, driving. You might say that they're, 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 they're bad drivers. Again, that's misinformation, it's mythology, right? But based on the misinformation about bad drivers, then the justifying mistreatment is who drives the car uh, when you get into a car with the, with the husband and the wife? Who typically becomes the one to drive the car? And then the internalized behavior might be that then the woman defy, defers to the man to be the driver, or the woman will feel like less confident in being a driver. And how that becomes a part of an internalized sense uh, of lacking confidence as a result of that. Another example would be uh, women as targeted. The misinformation is if a man is assertive or aggressive, then we lift it up and we celebrate that a man is aggressive or that we say he's a leader. But if a woman is assertive or aggressive, she tends to get labeled as, well, you know, uh, you know where to go from there. And then the justified mistreatment is uh, to make fun of them or to, um, to uh, estrange them or to distance from them or not put them in leadership roles. Um, and then the internalized behavior is that a woman will pretend uh, to not be a leader, to not be assertive, uh, to fit in. Um, there's a term there that fits into that when you talk about internalized behavior that some would call dummy down, uh, to pretend to not know as much as you know, uh, to not be the leader that you know that you can be. And even though you may be more skilled and uh, stronger, but then to defer to the man. And then one more about women here, because it's so uh, uh, so real. The target is that um, uh, women and the misinformation, if you ever go out and pay attention in the grocery store and the magazine racks and what women look like right? and what glamor looks like, and it's often, often thin uh, and, um, uh, and just, um, yeah, the thinner the woman, the, you know, the smaller the woman, uh, those parts of it. And then the justifying mistreatment is then if a woman is larger, not thin, is she's not attractive or doesn't get invited into those leadership roles or um, diminishment. And then the internalized behavior is then women, uh, the message is to beat them. And, uh, and so the point about that in the internalized behavior is the term, you know, anorexia and bulimia as a result of this cycle of oppression and how we project uh, what glamour looks like, what women are supposed to look like. And it's also it's, uh, that objectifying of women uh, rather than embracing the, the real look of people, but into this uh, a fantasy of what women are supposed to look like. Um, now I want to uh, maybe let's look at, I think we're ready now to look at uh, black male, Hispanic male youth as a targeted group. 
So if I'm a teacher and I think about black male, uh, Hispanic male youth in the classroom, the misinformation might be that they're, that they're coming from broken homes or, or that uh, the, the families are not investing in their education uh, or, or that they're not, they're not prepared to learn. And then the justified mistreatment, if I'm a teacher, might be not to invest in them, uh, to only uh, uh, invest in them for sports. Um, and so the justified mistreatment might be uh, put them in special education or expulsions and, and all those ways of, of not investing in them in terms of their academic abilities and talents, because based on this targeting and misinformation, a teacher might even have the imagination or the possibility uh, for those African American Latino male youth. And then, of course, the internalized behavior would be um, joining gangs, uh, doing drugs, um, only investing in, in sports. Um, and the result of that internalized behavior is this uh, school to prison pipeline uh, and the inordinate uh, number of uh, the proportion of youth of color uh, and young people of color who are incarcerated. Um, so that cycle and how that is perpetuated. And I really want to mention this uh, for us in terms of thinking about the targeting of George Floyd and the misinformation about George Floyd in terms of profiling. And uh, you know the term driving, driving while black, black or racial profiling. The thing about George Floyd and all of the George Floyds, the uh, Breonna Taylors, uh, uh, the Trayvon Martins, the uh, Orlando Castiles, those are examples of targeting the attachments to information and policing and the justified mistreatment is that racial profiling, uh, uh, putting, putting one's knees on his neck for eight minutes and 46 seconds. And, uh, and then the internalized behavior, of course, is that joining gangs, uh, distrust of the police, um, uh, and uh, another internalized behavior is that parents teaching their children, black parents teaching their children at a very young age about putting where to position your hands if you're pulled over by the police. And it's almost the assumption, the internalized behavior is uh, that black young people have done something wrong that would justify the police um, scrutinizing or, or uh, harassing, whatever that language is, it's a reflection of a cycle of oppression. And, and then lastly about this cycle of oppression is a recognition that you know, women, uh, young people, black, brown, uh, marginalized people, they don't set up this cycle, we do. And so we blame those who are targeted but we're actually the ones that set up and perpetuate the cycles. And so the challenge for us and in our institutions and uh, in, in our daily lives is how do we move ourselves from these cycles of oppression? And if I can take a moment, I know our time is getting shorter, to look at this cycle. And I wanna invite you and challenge you that um, when we tell stories about Jesus and the stories of scripture, so often we think about Jesus as a nice guy, a nice person uh, who came into the world and just kind of hung out with people, um, healing people. But the story of Jesus and those biblical stories are rich stories about the Son of God who came into the world incarnate and that relationship with people who are locked into cycles of oppression. So those biblical stories are rich stories about God and the person of Jesus Christ encountering people in cycles of oppression and how God relates to people. God establishes humanity with those people in relationship and stands in solidarity with them. So an example is a story about a woman at a well who goes to that well at the hottest part of the day because she's tired of hearing the stories of that cycle of oppression 
when she's at the mall with other people because they're always reminding her about the information or misinformation about broken relationships, broken marriages, and, and all of the, the negative things about her life. And so what that woman does is she goes to the well at the hottest part of the day so that the other people won't be there and she won't have to hear those stories about how awful her life is. And then the interception in that story is when Jesus comes and he relates to this woman, he has a relationship with this woman that lifts her up, that disrupts this cycle of oppression and celebrates her humanity and, and lifts her up. And then the story is about reconnecting her with community. And so these stories, I invite you that they're radical, revolutionary stories about God breaking down cycles of oppression and, and inviting people into cycles of relationship. And, and that's the duty of the church as well. Next slide, please. Um, so um, I think at this point we can, um, we can let go of the slide and we can um, go back to um, uh, the view. We can see each other maybe. So the last part that I want to talk about, and I invite conversation, is the power of the church. And so I mentioned that when I became um, um, invited into the church, that radical experience that I had as a child, um, that the experience that what every church does, and it's a history of our rich liturgical history, uh, the ways that we gather as church is we worship. And we worship, it's central that we, we say in worship, everybody is welcome, everybody is safe, and everybody belongs. That's foundational to what it means to be church together, worshiping to be a Christian body. Well, that welcome, safe, and safety and belonging is a core promise that God did with a woman at the well and God does to everybody that comes into our church, but too often we don't extend that welcome, safety, and belonging beyond the people that are familiar to us, or the people that have always been Muslim, the people that know the ethnic story about the church. And we need to radicalize that story of welcome, safety, and belonging, that it's not only what we do in our sanctuaries, but it's what we carry with us into the places where we work and where we play, where we study, that God's welcome and, and belonging is extended to everybody. And we haven't done a very good job of celebrating that beyond the hour or two that we do on Sunday morning. So that's the first is to be more missional about that. The second thing about the church is to, uh, to look at what we do when we are a church is that we, uh, what we do is catechesis, as we, 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 the teaching of the church. And, and too often, that's restricted to our cognitive knowledge. You know, what we've been, the books that we've read, uh, uh, the Bible that we know. But, but the catechesis, it's not just our cognitive learning, it's also our experience and exploration. So it's the whole way of how we come to be in relationship with God and relationship with one another. So the church is about welcome, safety, and belonging. The church is about catechesis, uh, learning about God both cognitively and experientially. And then lastly, when we talk about discipleship and witness, uh, that's uh, the fulfillment of our potential. That God in our witness in our discipleship is that we become co-creators with God. And so to take that calling to be co-creators in the ways that we relate to other people and we carry the voice of justice that, that God invites us to be co-creators in the ways that we embody the presence of God in the world. So I might, maybe that this would be a, a good time to open it up to conversation. I don't know what might be uh, in the chat um, and how we facilitate a conversation from here. Well, thank you. 
Kelly, and um, we'll see if there's many questions. Otherwise, we'll let you continue. Um, uh, so I did, first we'll see if, uh, if there's any questions that came up. Heather, is there any that's? At this time, we don't have any questions in the chat, but everyone's welcome to submit some there and I'll keep an eye on it. Okay. Well, um, well while, while we're waiting for that, hopefully there will be some questions and there's still some people here. Uh, is that um, in relation to George Floyd and all of the, the disruption that has happened, as that my experience uh, as a pastor and as a black pastor uh, in the Lutheran church, there's been a groundswell of people wanting to know more, uh, be in relationship. And so a result has been that um, many more white people want to be in relationship with people of color and, and they want to know how, because the reality is they've been living in siloed worlds in communities and so um, it's like for 400 years uh, black brown marginalized people have been saying to the white community we have a problem here racism is a problem and the response has been lukewarm at best from the white community now that response from the white community as excuse the pun but i say it's white hot uh, that people really want to, um, to do something about the divide, the, the injustice, the inequity. But the challenge is that new passion and awareness of the white people is a response from black people and marginalized people. And we've been saying this to you for 400 years and we haven't gotten a response. So now you expect us to just open up and be receptive to, to this new fine passion. Why would we trust you why would we be vulnerable to you? And so there's work to be done to repair that breach that has existed for 400 years. Another reality is that uh, when we talk about white supremacy, uh, uh, systemic white racism, the experience of black and brown and marginalized people is that when we, when, in the workplace, though we may be in the same space together, it's still a space that is defined by white whiteness, white worldview. And so what happens for people of color with work and settings, but there's still settings that are privileged toward white. And so there's a, the awareness and the fear that if I say the wrong thing, I'm going to lose my job. Or, or it's that cycle of oppression that in any minute, I'm, I'm going to be I'm going to wind up in that cycle again. And so building a level of trust to be vulnerable is a, is a challenge for black, brown, and marginalized people, even as white people are ready now to be in deeper relationship. And so we need to do the work about bridging that gap. And so my point about that is that white people need to continue to do work with white people to gain more awareness in preparation for being in real authentic relationship with people of color. And people of color need to do work to, to build trust that, that white people can really be trusted. And it's not this, I mean, I, I apologize that the language is very limited in terms of white and, um, but it's, it's a language that we have right now. So, but that's that's part of the journey. Yes, Kelly, we've gotten several questions now coming. I know, uh, and so Heather, why don't you uh, yeah. begin? There's several here that need to be responded to. I think. Yep, and so, and they they do overlap a little bit, but I'll just start at the top, and we'll kind of see how how it goes. <clears throat> the first question is, what are your ideas for desegregating the church when so many people cling to what they grow up with? Uh, well, the, it begins with awareness. Uh, and so everything that you've been hearing today is really about increasing awareness. And uh, there's a book called White Fragility. So read the book, like White Fragility, and then that, that, that is a resistance and something that white people need to be more aware of in terms of the, the tendency for white people. So the need for, um, for black, brown, and marginalized people is to speak truth, 
to the experience that black, brown, and marginalized people have. Often what happens for white people is what that fragility is that white people then feel guilty, blame, and shame, and that just cuts off the conversation, right? And so uh, one of the gifts that I have is because I've lived in white spaces um, pretty much all my life. I, I anticipate white fragility. I will say things in ways that are more palatable that may not, they help white people to not go to a place of guilt and hear me longer than they would hear somebody that doesn't know their story, that doesn't, um, doesn't speak, oh, how, what a language would I say, um, in such a conciliatory way, right? So I think I'm answering your question. Um, but what, what needs to happen is that white people and white institutions need to do work to be more aware of the way that they come across. Uh, the power that whiteness has and the ways that there's a 400 year history of that. So white people are not today overnight gonna uh, to be literate and or effective in reaching out to other people because there's 400 years of, of history in whiteness that white people have not paid attention to. Mm -hmm. We need to keep going with these questions, Kelly, because there's a bunch of them. So I guess Kelly, you're going to have to invite me back. <laughs> <laughs> Anytime. Kelly, Kelly, this is from your friend Shelby. Uh, she asks, mm -hmm. as a black man, what has been your experience of being pulled over in your car? How do you deal with it? And what kinds of advice do you have for young people? Yeah. Well, I, it was a norm for me growing up. And so uh, young people have become much more aware of uh, their voice and their power. But when I, when I got pulled over when I was young, I, I, would, I would get extremely nervous, I would sweat. And almost every time when the officer came to my car, he would say, why are you so nervous? And, he would, and, and saying that, it was, the implication was that I'd done something wrong. And, and so he could not, he couldn't relate to the nervousness that happened for me, but immediately when I saw uh, police lights come on, I get extremely nervous. And I think that that's trauma. That wasn't just based on the experience, but trauma that I inherited from, from my parents, from their parents. And so that policing, it went beyond the logic of that immediate moment, but to an experience of trauma that I had, um, that I inherited, that went beyond that particular moment. Thank you, Shelby, and hello. Thank you, Shelby. thank you for sharing that. Um, this, this question comes from George Dalman, and he says, um, Kelly, our church is looking to become a church of reconciliation. We're trying to figure out how to do so while helping those who disagree learn how to accept rather than leave the church. How, how do we do that? I think there's work to, to be done that when we say that we're inviting people in, we need to do the preparation work to really invite them in and not just to come in to assimilate, to do like we are, but to be aware of things like worldview and what are, what are, what are areas of compromise? What are, uh, and compromise isn't really a good word, but we're, what are the places of sharing different traditions and different ways of coming together so it isn't just coming in and saying, um, black, brown people, we want you to come to our church, but, but pretend that you're white. You know? pretend, that you're, pretend that you're from, from Norway. Right? Um, that's another one. So not to be political, but, but to be aware, like when, uh, when President Trump uh, talked about Africa and Haiti and those countries being, uh, being uh, outhouses, right? And then at the same time, he lifted up Norway and, and European countries. So that in itself was that mythology about the cycle of oppression, that diminishing one country or, or, or nation um, and lift or continent even, and lifting up another. And so again, the symbols of, of what is pure, what is good, 
and, and what is what is uh, of less value or no value actually. Yeah, thank you. Um, Diane and Paul Jacobson ask, Kelly, could you talk more about what practices you've observed that help break destructive cycles and, and what practices are more harmful than helpful? Uh, well, we got all my people on here. So. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, practices like rethink, I mean, really, this is a really important one, rethinking how we worship. And, and not that worship has to change, but thinking about the power of worship, the power of welcome, safety, and belonging. If that is a core value of the church, and then we really look at, well, how do we communicate that? How do we lift that up as a value? And I promise you, if, you, if we communicate that people, I don't care where you're from, if they experience the church as a place of welcome, safety, and belonging, that's a core human value. And if our churches would really invest in that, and that it isn't how we worship that's primary, it's does our worship facilitate welcome, safety, and belonging? And, and how expansive is that? Is that something that is like, is, is, it, is it a reaffirmation of a cultural experience or is it a missional experience that invites people to experience their value in their work? as we gather as a people of God. I promise you, if we would really, if we would really embrace welcome, safety, and belonging, and that our worship is missional and inviting, we can transform the world. Mm. Beautifully said. Uh, we have a, a question from Linda who asks, given the understandable lack of trust in white people, what, if anything, can white people do to support the black community in the days ahead, and in parentheses, during the trial in particular? The, the first thing, that's a great question, and I would challenge it to have that very, to live with that very question with white people. That corporately, for white people to think, white people, think through what can we do to be welcoming to people that aren't like us? And to have that be a, a corporate, a conversation about white people so that it's a, it's a collaborative response. It's a, and, and, it, and not put that on, on black people and people of color, but it's really the opportunity to exhibit what white people want and not doing it because it's what black people want. I mean, make it a celebration and not an obligation. Mm. Uh, we do. I have one, just one last question here that I wanted to circle back to um, from David TD. He wants to know: Was Willie in the Sunday school when you arrived? <laughs> uh, no, no, I I gotten the directions wrong, and uh, and thankfully I got the, the the directions wrong. If I'd gone like two more blocks, Willie's uh, the pastor of the church where Willie was. I found this out years later. Was someone that my father knew from Tennessee. Uh, it was an African-American pastor. <clears throat> that was the pastor of Willie's Church, just like two blocks further down from where I, I wound up. So, uh, I thank God for that. Hmm. Uh, and I, I'm so excited, even at David Keady, my goodness. I, <laughs> this is like a reunion. Yeah, the, ga the gang's all here. Yeah. Okay, Jack, that's the end of my questions. Can I hand it back over to you? Yes, I just want to Denver Bittner Pastor Denver Rittner asked a question about uh, how do we develop a cycle of inclusion in a very concrete way in a church. And um, as we know, if you want to get to have a relationship with someone, you got you have to know somebody different than you. And how does our churches allow, I'm going to amplify <laughs> Denver's question since he's such a good friend, but um, how, how do we really concretely help churches uh, get involved uh, in a broader community? And I say that with an eye towards what you're already doing, Kelly, and your deep knowledge of what Augsburg is already doing in the community. Are there some concrete ways that you know of that some congregations, at least in the Twin Cities, could could begin a, a, a different kind of dialogue? Uh, well, one of them is like, um, the cycle of oppression, uh, Denver, take that 
and and walk through the story of Jesus and the and those biblical stories. Those are really stories about how Jesus confronts those cycles of oppression and um, really liberating those stories of Jesus. So those model how Jesus was in relationship with people that were not typically in the synagogue, not in the church, because they've been given this message that they didn't belong. And those stories can be liberating in themselves. Secondly, there's this great resource called um, the Intercultural Development Inventory. And what that does, it's research-based. And you take it, it takes about 20 minutes, and it gives you feedback. Uh, and one is like, what is our, our aspiration? What, how do we desire, how, what is our aspiration in the world? The ways that we reach out, now, and Denver's question, now how, do we, how do we be who God calls us to be? That's aspirational. Then the feedback of, also of that uh, um, inventory is how the world experiences us. And so there's the aspiration, you know, how we talk about being the church, and then there's a the reality about how the world experiences the church, right? And so then there's this gap that's called the continuum. And then you do the work of bridging that continuum. So you see, well, okay, how do we get closer to how we want the world to experience us? And that takes work. So, so that's a great resource. So Kelly, can you make sure that Heather gets uh, a link to that resource and the person that does that in the community? Because um, I remember doing that with you some years ago um with our little collaboration of churches in the north and in the city of minneapolis um because that that really would be a very concrete way for people in a very non-threatening manner to become more aware and become more awakened um, i'd appreciate that yeah. and kudos to augsburg some years ago augsburg all of the faculty and staff did the idi the intercultural development inventory yep. And that led to a huge increase in the diversity and student body at Augsburg. So yeah, and we continue to do it. I think in the ten years I've been at Augsburg, I've gone through it three times. Yeah, very helpful. Well, Kelly, thank you so much. You know, as a a friend, but also as uh, the leadership that you've given in so many different areas, not just in the Lutheran Church, but on the North Side and other places. Peter Sangi that that said a definition of leadership is a person that has a fierceness of direction coupled with a disarming humility. And what I've always loved about you is that you never compromise your convictions, uh, but you let your love and your care um, be first. And so then it's easier to hear your commitment, but you do not sacrifice your fierceness of direction, uh, but you do it with such humility. And um, so thankful today is the same as you've included us and you've included your history. Um, it's been such a, a welcome way to have a, such a difficult conversation. So we're grateful that you're with us this day. And I just, before we uh, conclude, want to know that, want you to know that next week we have David Stark coming and he's, um, Presbyterian minister, but has spent much of his life uh, in the world of consulting and working with organizations. He's written a small 31-day uh, uh, devotional on, on uh, looking at the book of Exodus as a parallel to how we address the pandemic. And it's a little ebook. You only can get it uh, through... Um, I think Amazon for five dollars. Yep, it's on Amazon. Five dollars and ninety-five cents, but it's well worth it. You can either read it all the way through, or you can see it as thirty-one days of meditation. But anyway, David will be with us next week. He says this. He says the journey, the Exodus journey, was long and arduous, uh, and things got worse before they got better, like some of us feel today. During that time, the Israelites relied on their faith in God and in the miracles he performed in their lives to, to assure them of his love and his commitment to them. 
next week he's going to use situations from the book of Exodus to draw a roadmap on how today we might overcome the difficulties that we're facing during these multiple crises. So anyway, look forward to having David Stark with us next week. And again, thank you so much, Kelly, for being with us and for your vulnerability as well as what we learned. So take care, all. Thank you. Thank you. See you next week.